My chief desire in all my writings is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and to make Him beautiful and glorious in the eyes of people and to promote the increase of repentance, faith, and holiness upon earth. J.C. Ryle Hello everyone, you are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Zelwyn Heidi. Today we're going to be talking about Bishop J.C. Ryle. That's John Charles Ryle for the folks at home. Zelwyn, how are you? Doing great, Willie. The weather is nice here. It's been kind of on the cool side, actually, of things. We haven't had a very hot summer yet, but uh, the trees are in full bloom and everything is just beautiful, and the bees are out, and I feel like I'm really enjoying this warmer weather. I don't know what's come over me. <laughs> well, it is uh, very stormy right now. We're getting a late start recording here, so it just continues to rain. You might even be able to hear the thunder on the microphone. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll see if we'll see if the electricity stays on, so we can and the internet, so we can get this thing going. I was just out in uh, in Denver preaching. Uh, Adam's installation out at Trinity in Denver. And I got to say that mountain air though, that was some 80 degrees, no humidity. A guy could get used to something like that. It's true. It's true. I mean, the West is your ultimate destiny, Willie, just admit it. So (laughs) the the spirit of the, of the West calls me (laughs) beckoning you like Macedon. I had a vision of Buffalo Bill Cody. (laughs) Saying, get over here. Right. When you see me shaving the beard into a 19th century uh, style goatee and mustache, you know the time has come. (laughs) No, it's it's all good. Well, how did did that all go, though? Oh, Oh. uh, yeah, wonderful. Glad to be a part of that installation. Wonderful congregation. A lot of wonderful things happening there. A very committed congregation to uh, both the doctrine handed down to us, but also uh, Christian life. Uh, so just very good to see. Got to see a lot of familiar faces. They roasted a whole hog for the uh, for the installation. So they they did it right. They did it right. Way to go! That's that's almost too wholesome for words. It is. It is. Yeah. But we can uh, next next episode we'll get Adam back on. He can he can give us the whole rundown. It'll be it'll be a good time. Speaking of Anglicans. <laughs> We're going to talk about J.C. Ryle today. Now, a lot of you are going to go, but this is a Lutheran podcast. Why are we talking about non-Lutherans? We told you we're going to do this. Uh, there are there are things we can learn from people who aren't Lutheran. Uh, there are just interesting people throughout history, interesting battles fought along different denominational lines that are worth discussing. J.C. Ryle was very big in his time and was forgotten for a couple of generations, and then there was a big revival in the reading of his works. So we think he's he's worth reading, worth looking into, worth considering. He's going to say some things, and we'll talk about it a bit more uh, in the episode that we obviously wouldn't agree with. But he also says quite a few things that we we would agree with. So we'll we'll talk about that a bit. Zelwyn, you're a Ryle super fan. What do you have to say by way of introduction? <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think you put it quite well. That yes, just because we are. Looking at this guy, considering his life, considering what he has to say, doesn't necessarily mean that we are agreeing with absolutely everything that he says. But I find Ryle to be very helpful, especially because he has such a way with words. Uh, He has ways of saying things that make them extremely memorable. And he also has a zeal that I think has been rarely matched, especially for reaching those whom, in his day especially, were overlooked. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when when being a clergyman in his time was a matter of respectability, a matter of, you know, rubbing elbows with the, the well-to-do, Ryle was much more interested in reaching common men and speaking to his own, you know, to those even below him in a way that they could understand. And I think that's something yeah. that we would do well to imitate in our day yeah, and age. Right. And it's interesting. He's known for being really rather warm, as far as his personality goes, we think about these great evangelists throughout history, and often they're sort of aloof or or even downright cold, like Jonathan right. Edwards or something like that. And that's not really the case with him. Right, right. Well, and especially because he was not afraid to get his you know hands dirty, to use an expression. 
right. to really and, get down in the muck and the mire and to speak to these people, especially like the, the laboring classes in Liverpool at the end of his life, right? right. Do you want to uh, get started and we'll go through his uh, his life here? Yeah, I mean, I think probably the the best way to begin talking about Ryle is really just to talk about his early life, not in a Wikipedia way, of course, but uh, just to talk... <laughs> to talk about who he is and where he came from and why he ended up in the ministry. So J.C. Ryle was born uh, May the 10th, 1816, into a wealthy family. And by his own admission, he was a very worldly kind of youth. He was interested in sports. He was interested in, I guess you could say, you know, living it up, kind of just being a typical young man of his age. And it wasn't until later that he becomes converted and actually serious in his Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there anything that you would add to that, Willie, before we keep going? Uh, No. I mean, we're going to get into kind of how he stumbles into the ministry. But born into that wealthy family, you know, he really mirrors a lot of, of our young men today. Just obsessed with the things of the world, frivolous things, you know, sports are his whole life and kind of college living, he has a life of ease until he doesn't. And that's the interesting thing. Right, right, right. Especially because, um, you know, he enters Oxford when he gets old enough. So it shows, you know, just how wealthy he actually is. This is in October of 1834. And he's, again, very interested in the world, very interested in sports, not even the best student for a while, which I think is interesting. You know, he's, kind of almost a little bit of on the jock end of of things. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But uh, in 1837, in the month of June, he begins to focus more on the things of God. Because as least as the stories go, he heard a preacher preaching at that time on Ephesians 2 verse 8. Right. And if, if, I mean, it could be apocryphal if that actually happened. But if it did happen, he has a very stark kind of experience that causes him to really consider what he's doing with his life. Right. And remember, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Right. Right. And that really, I mean, that really has an impression on him, this whole experience in 1837. And it causes him to become even even a little bit more... What I mean, he becomes in what was called in those times an evangelical. And in his society in, you know, in the 19th century England, to be an evangelical was a little bit of a, how do you want to say? I mean, it was not looked upon well in social circles. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Yeah. I mean, yeah, you have the three, the three, what will develop into the three schools, but you're kind of latitudinarian and you're ritualist, and then you're evangelicals. Right. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more, because he actually yeah. has something to say, especially about Tractarians. But but the big thing that I think really changes his life, especially early on, is the fact that his father uh, files for bankruptcy in June 1841. And as a result of that, uh, all of the family wealth is taken away, and they become basically destitute. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, J.C. Ryle isn't really quite sure what to do anymore because he doesn't have any prospects in front of him because they're broke now, because there's nothing left for them in society. And so he decides to enter into the ministry December, and was ordained December 12th, 1841. He almost kind of falls backwards into the ministry, but he himself would consider it to be the hand of God later in his life, mm-hmm. leading him into this to do this. What do you want to add to that, Willie? Well, I think that it's it's important to note here that even if someone has kind of a frivolous early life or even sort of a sputtering start in the ministry, it does not mean that God's hand isn't in it. It doesn't mean that he still won't do great things. There is a creeping professionalism within the ministry, and I think that this is pro- probably present within every denomination. And in a world where we live with status calls and things like that, you have to roll your eyes a little bit. But we do have, you know, there's some of that present among 
our roster as well. That the idea of a pastor as a status symbol. Now, you live in a non Lutheran area, it doesn't really matter. You got non Lutheran parents, it doesn't really matter. But in some areas, that could that's a temptation, I suppose. There's always the temptation to high office, of course. Right. Which is, which is not really something that Ryle suffered, it just happens to him. Right. But to, um, to treat the office as, as something of a status symbol is a, is a bad idea because that's not the point of it. The point of it is to preach the gospel, administer the sacraments, and all the other attendant duties related to those things. You know, the point of wearing the collar is so that people know what you do. It's not so that you'll get free coffee and other perks by being out. Now, <laughs> now it, it, the time is coming where in many places, the wearing of the collar as a symbol of being a clergyman will actually just get hate heaped upon you. So, right. you know, it might be hard for some listeners to relate to this because the office is not really respected in our society. Right. You know, it's it's hard to even get some people to refer to you as pastor or even or reverend or let alone reverend or something like that. Uh because the office has been so belittled. But that's not the case in Ryle's day. Right. And when we say that Ryle gets his hands dirty with the uh, working class, we're not saying that he belittles the office in any way. Uh, we're simply saying that he stands in contrast to kind of a prevailing notion of the priesthood present in Anglicanism at the time. Right. Well, even even his falling into the ministry, you know, he's kind of forced into it. I th- We shouldn't see that as a negative thing either, because, again, as he says, you know, God uses him for that or, you know, uses this to bring him to that so that he can accomplish great things. But we also don't want to approach the ministry in our day with a kind of, oh, well, I don't know what else I would do. Because you sometimes see that notion, too, where, you know, young men will will go into the ministry because they have no other idea of how they might be able to serve God or because of, you know, seeking, you know, something, anything to, to be able to do. I mean, God is going to use us for his purposes, whether that's in the ministry or whether it's not. So we want to approach the ministry with a seriousness and to recognize that if if we do enter into it, that God, you know, is using, you know, our situation for his purposes, but not just to treat it as a, I don't know, a plan B or a backup plan or something like that. Right. Yeah. And yeah, or, or you know, treat it like any other job, which right. which really is what was going on in England at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and especially, I mean, even... Even with the, uh, the the professionalism and the high status of the ministry, I mean, you had ministers who were basically living like the nobility and barely carrying out their duties at all. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, curates who were more interested in hunting and and drinking and you know parties and stuff like that than they were in actually proclaiming the word. So it is very much a real problem in Ryle's time. Yeah, but do definitely. You want, do you want to add anything to that, Willie? Before we move on, I uh, know. Let's let's move on. Okay. So once once Ryle is ordained in eighteen forty one, his first parish is a very small one in Folly, is what it's called. And it was even though it was very small, he was very diligent in his work. He was very conscientious about what he was doing, trying to really reach the few hundred members of his parish as best as he could. Uh, but then he also, a couple of years later, though, he is called to St. Thomas in Winchester in December 1843, which he stays for at a for a very short period of time, because five months later, he gets the call to Hel- Helmingham in Suffolk, which is a far more comfortable position for him. Whether he moved there because of financial considerations, I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, he didn't talk much about why he did what he did, especially in this early point in his life. Um, but while he is there, he gets married for the first time in 1845, but he also lives extremely frugally. And uh, some of the biographers who have talked about Ryle believe that he did so as a way of using that his income in order to pay off his father's debts, basically taking everything that he got and using it to help restore the family name. And as a result, he tries to live very frugally in order to do so which I think is 
too wholesome for words. I mean, <laughs> right. But I mean, the fact that he does this shows that his concern right now is not just for himself. He's not interested in these calls because of some sort of worldly desire. He's not interested in it because he wants the attention. He's interested in these things as a way of helping out, especially with his family and, you know, being able to support them in, in that in any way that they could. So right. do you want to add anything to that before we move on? Uh, no, no, you hit the nail on the head. Okay. He has a few experiences wh- uh, while he's in Helmingham. Uh, his first daughter is born in 1847, um, but his wife, Matilda, his first wife, Matilda, dies as a result of that uh, several months later in June of 1848. She basically becomes so weak and she just never really recovers from the experience. And so a little bit of grief early on in his life then and losing his wife because of that. And I think that will go on to influence him, you know, kind of shape him throughout the rest of his life. But the the one big thing that really begins in terms of his career while he's at Helmingham is he begins writing tracks. And Willie, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? And then we'll talk about what he was doing with them. Yeah. I mean, well, like tracks in general, let's talk about it. Uh, okay. the, the forgotten art, because we, we associate them only with Jack chick nowadays or something like that. He's writing tracks as a way to reach people with simple, simple gospel resources. These are things meant to either be sold or given out for free that comment on certain issues. Uh, understand that he also exists in a day where there is a war for the future of his church. Mm-hmm. Possibly a time where people are not well versed in Christian doctrine. So he is, you know, writing these things twofold. Uh, one to to contend for his position, his theological position within the church and to simply uh, reach these people. So he's going to write tracts, which can be... Tract is kind of a broad term. It can be everything from a small pamphlet to really book size in, at this time. Right. Most of the tracts that, if you read them, I mean, like you say, they're not like Jack Chick type tracts, you know, where it's just a few pages with comics or something like that. I think we have a very skewed idea of what a tract is. You might think of it more like, I don't know, kind of like a blog post or something like that. Yeah. To kind of put it into our terms. Uh, yeah, something... yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Uh, it's the proto blog. <laughs> he was the first blogger in the 19th century. But his his point with doing this is, like you said, he's, he's speaking to a number of issues that are going on in his day, very live issues, and trying to present these questions to people in a way that is very clear, that is very simple, that is very straightforward. And Ryle really does have a knack for this kind of clarity and simplicity, which is why I think he was so popular, at least in his own day, and why he is becoming more popular now, you know, now Mm -hmm. that there's been a revival of interest in him, because he does have a way of stating things in a very clear and a very winsome manner. Right. And, and that really is his key or his, his, uh, his great strength is his mode of presentation and clear communication it was something that i think we would do well to try to imitate right it, it, it's matter of fact it gets to the point but he does it in a very effective way well it's time for our first break we'll be right back with more word fitly spoken right after this 
everyone. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Zelwyn Heidi. We're talking about Bishop J.C. Ryle. Well, Zelwyn, we got through um, a big chunk of his life there, so what should we talk about now? Well, I think what we should talk about is something we were alluding to towards the end of the previous segment, which is that he begins to write tracks in Helmingham in earnest, but the questions that he's especially focused on and something that he's going to continue to be focused on through the rest of his life are issues dealing with uh, what was called Tractarianism, uh, ritualism, or sometimes even Anglo-Catholicism. Now, those are all kind of broad terms, but can you kind of help unpack them, Willie? You know, what, what, are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about <laughs> yeah. these things? So, Lutherans, as we're talking about this, please try not to impose... <laughs> these terms upon Lutheranism, because it can become... We, we use the terms high church and low church and Lutheranism today. Those are borrowed terms from Anglicanism. Right. So we can talk a little bit about how it might apply to us, but right now we're just talking about 19th century England. Now, ritualism proper just originally would have referred to those who believed in the high church ceremonies, but still adhered very strongly to the 39 Articles. Okay, and, and the Book of Common Prayer. The Oxford Movement comes about, which will lead to a ritualistic revival, which will push ritualism away from something that is very Anglican towards something that would be called Anglo-Catholic. And it's a very, very, very condensed version of it. So let me unpack that a little bit. Okay. The Oxford Movement, colloquially known as the Tractarians, uh, because they published a series of documents called Tracts for Our Times between 1833 and 1841. Essentially, they lived at a time where many of the pastors were evangelicals, and this is 19th century evangelical, so very much Methodist influenced that style of evangelical. They saw the move away from tradition as onerous to the church and, uh, and a poisonous uh, thing. It it actually all comes about as a result of something called the Church Temporalities Bill in 1833, uh, which had to do with uh, the Church of Ireland and uh, and administration of it. This is the most British church controversy I can think of. <laughs> uh, but basically, they saw a a push to forcibly make a lot of English parishes or a lot of Anglican parishes into Reformed things. And you could make the argument that Anglicanism was reformed at its origin, but that's neither here nor there. The fact is they always retained, for the most part, a lot of the ceremonies that the broader reformed movement didn't. Right. So the Oxford movement uh, will, will, will kick off as a result of that. It'll be birthed in 1833, and the beginning of the Oxford movement is a sermon by Kebley called National Apostasy, which has to deal with this very complicated thing, but then again, it goes back to the uh, church temporalities bill. But <laughs> if everybody's still listening, point is, they thought the church needed more ceremonies. They thought the church needed to go back to her Catholic roots. And now it's going to get tricky because this is where the third branch theory of Anglicanism comes from. So the idea is that the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and the Anglican Church represent three branches of the Catholic Church pre-schism. So, okay. so the, Angl the Anglo Church gets to be its own thing. That, that's how they see it. Now, that high churchmanship and high church becomes kind of forever associated with Angl Anglo-Catholicism after this. Notable men from the Oxford movement would, be, would, would become Roman Catholic, namely Newman, John right. Henry Newman. So that poisoned the waters, and one of the uh, critiques that men like Ryle and other, other evangelicals will have of the Oxford movement is that it is Romanizing. Right, right. Well, I mean, because Newman wasn't the only one, if I remember correctly. No, I mean, uh, there were didn't, others. Didn't Pusey, did Pusey go to Rome um, eventually, or did he stay? I can't remember. Well, Pusey, um, he's an interesting one because... Um, uh, no, I mean, he didn't. Sorry to, to answer. No, but he's actually a, a really uh, in, inspiring kind of character because he he like Newman is working with people that were largely on the fringes. Right. Right. But, yeah. And, 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 you know, he 
he comes in uh, sympathizing uh, with with the Oxford movement very early <laughs> by the end of 1833. Right. And 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 here's the thing. And here and here's where we've got to be careful with this as, as Lutherans because you look at someone like Pusey, and I mean he's even he's even on the uh, Church of England calendar of saints. <laughs> like he contributes to ritualism, but he also revives the doctrine of the real presence among Anglicans. Right. So it's hard right. for us to to just wholesale agree with Ryle on this. Right. Because because right. as 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 good as Ryle is on a lot of things, and you'll and if you decide to pick up any of his books and read them after this, you're going to be like, okay, this is re- really good. And then you'll get to the sacraments. Right. <laughs> and and it'll and it'll not it won't be good. <laughs> well, I mean, because he he comes at it from a perspective basically that if this is what's causing the abuse, that must mean you know that we need to go further back or something like that. That you know that ritualism as a whole needs to be rejected because of what it's trying to say. And again, I yeah, we can't fully agree with that, but at the same time, we can certainly understand and even sympathize with some of Ryle's concerns. Because I think the the major concern that Ryle has with something like ritualism, even though it is Romanizing in his view, is that it it, it may breed a kind of how do you want to say Willie, a kind of superstitious approach to the sacraments. Yeah, is that fair? Th- th- yeah, that's his concern. But he also has the. I mean, he's an evangelical of the 19th century. So, I mean, he's even, <laughs> Wesley was better on this than him. Um, <laughs> because you're talking about a time in Anglicanism where baptismal regeneration is not a given. Right. Now, it, see, this is the strange thing about Anglicans, uh, because uh, Newman, at one point, for example, says that the tenets of Anglo-Catholicism are perfectly consistent with the 39 Articles, which is a reformed right. document. I, I will, I will die on that hill. I, I believe that, it, it, or or the Thirty Nine Articles are so broad that they might as well be reformed. Oh, I thought okay. Now I, I get what you're saying. Now I thought you were saying like you'll die on that hill, like that he said that. <laughs> oh no, no! I mean, there's nothing to die on. He said it, and then and then and then poked. Um, and understand that there are. You're talking about the Church of England, where in the 1600s there's violence over whether or not you wear a surplus or not. Right, 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 right. I mean, that's that's kind of some of the, the deepest roots of ritualism, right? That, you know, that we can wear a surplus and that and that becomes that kind of impetus. Well, why, why not bring in all of these other things? I mean, cue the, the movie on, uh, <laughs> right. on the Roman temple, that sort of thing. Right, but, it, and he is correct in this way, that it becomes if it becomes simply an obsession over doing everything the correct way, that that's right. all you focus on. And that is a real temptation. I am in favor of traditional ceremonies, vestments and everything. Anyone who's been around me knows that, or has been to my parish knows this or your parish since you're, you're all high churchy now. That's true. Uh, <laughs> and yet we, we also know that those things alone uh, are not what, what will uh, save people that we do need to go outside the doors. The gospel needs to be preached. People need to be brought in. And I think fundamentally that's going to be Ryle's concern. Right. Right. Well, and especially because, you know, in our time with what we call high church ism. And again, I say what we call, because we don't want to, you know, say that it's exactly the same thing. There are some notable differences. But, you know, we don't want to fall into a trap of turning these ceremonies, turning these things as the end in themselves, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe maybe you don't do that. You know, maybe we say we, we have these things just because, you know, they're good because they preach the gospel, that sort of thing. And that's fine. That's why we should have them. But then, you know, what we do want to make sure that we don't un- inadvertently say we have to have these things in order to preach the gospel. Right. <laughs> Sure, sure, yeah, sure, <laughs> yeah, but well, yeah, but I don't want on this, Willie. <laughs> no, I just, don't, I just don't want to go too far. I, I do believe that if we, if you have a pastor who who understands the gospel well or whatever, then the gospel won't be lost if you lose ceremony. 
I believe that we are in a, a, a state of confession at this point to where we need to maintain as much ceremony as we can. Uh, that we That we live in a time where certain adiaphorans are not adiaphora. And so it's hard to talk about it in a context that's so different from ours, 19th sure. century England. Now, there are some of our men who have become so wrapped up in historic ceremonies that that has been their, their sole focus. And, and that has led them down a bad path. Uh, they have perhaps forgotten the gospel because of that. And yet, as we see people leaving the broad evangelical landscape, the ones who are still left with some measure of faith seem to be going back to churches that have historical ties. Sure. Now, what happens with certain Tractarians, although not all, and I would argue that with the exception of Newman and a couple others, they're still firmly committed Anglicans, you know, even though they sort of blaze their own trail, you know, is that, that they, they find their security then in history. All right. And, and I get it, but they end up abandoning what they once said was the gospel. Um, and rich and, and the ritualistic side of the church did lead them to that. Now, again, very real, real risk of, of ritual leading you off to Rome or something like that. However, I think in our day, what you, what you see more of is Lutheran churches that have abandoned, abandoned historic worship, the historic liturgy, the creeds, the sacraments, frankly, and the kids grow up in what is basically a a Baptist church or whatever, or whatever it looks like, a Methodist church. A lot of our churches in the 60s and 70s probably just look Methodist. And and they go away. They, they don't stay in our churches because we were ashamed of what we are. They were raised outside of, of Lutheranism, ostensibly, and so they, they went to that. The people that we see coming into our churches today, what are they wanting? They are If, if someone is Googling Searching for a Lutheran church, they are expecting a traditional Lutheran service nine times out of ten. Sure, sure. So no, you know, nobody Google's. Nobody's like, man, I'm really into Lutheranism because I know Lutherans, and that means drum kits, laser shows, and dunking people in cattle troughs. <laughs> no, I mean your your point is well made, Willie. That you know, it is difficult to just directly compare ourselves with this very different I know you I, I know you're wanting me to dunk on the Anglo-Catholics <laughs> but you won't do it <laughs> No I'll do it it's just be like Newman and go, go on I, I I find the th- I don't know if I can maybe if an Anglican would sit me down and explain how they're the the third branch of traditional Christianity I could be convinced but I'm just not seeing it I'm just not seeing it in the text <laughs> Well, and I guess the the reason I find Ryle to be so helpful is because he does emphasize a kind of conscientiousness. He does emphasize a need for a living faith, you know, that we don't want to approach yes. things like the sacraments in a way that, oh, well, I took the sacrament this morning, so I don't need to think about God for the rest of the week. No, a- absolutely. Absolutely. You and know. and also to his credit, as a bishop, he's not really bigoted against the ritualists. Right. Like, they like they don't like him, but when he dies, they're all very respectful of him because they knew what kind of man he was. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, and there is this this kind of cold ritualism that creeps in. Okay, I've got my, I've done my my prayer office for the day. I'm good, or I've done my uh, my Sunday hour of obligation, so I'm golden. Right. And and he speaks, and he tries to avoid that as much as he can, which is why I do find him so helpful, even if I can't agree with what he has to say about the sacraments. Yeah, I mean, he's he is. Uh, stressing the need for a living faith. And as he sees it, uh, the other, the other side is in danger of not having that. Right. And yeah, it's just, it's just so hard as a Lutheran to talk about this because we're, we're like both camps rolled into one. (laughs) And, and not living in the middle of that controversy either. And yeah, it just, I don't know. 
I find that uh, the the issues that Ryle's concerned about with Anglo Catholicism and all of those sorts of things, I do find them to be valid, even if we can still admire a man like Pusey. You yeah, know what I mean? no, I agree. I agree, and so. I find I find Newman a much more complicated figure. Um, not only because he went to Rome, that's but for other things. Other things. We'll just just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, and and again, I I mean, I find this all it's all interesting. So I'm my I think my blinder is trying to be as as uh, objectively fair to these guys as I can, and that just comes across as very nice and non condemning sometimes. <laughs> so well, especially when you're you're trying to not fall into the same kinds of thought patterns, I suppose, you know, trying to see these things objectively. But right, right. It is what it is. And you know, as I have an incense, have a, as I have a sensor, you know, just burning incense right now behind me. <laughs> but the question is is what is it burning? That's the right. real question. <laughs> all my all my, all my uh incense is made in West Virginia. <laughs> By the way, I feel I need to say that's at an actual monastery. That sounds like a, I made a, uh, a marijuana joke, but no, there's there's a monastery in West Virginia that I buy the incense from. Well, do you want to say anything else about the these movements before we move on? Talking no, about I mean just to say you're looking at a uh, rather divided church, and and it looks some of the and some of the battle lines do look very similar to what to what we have today. And so it's, you know, it's very fun to see that, but also difficult not to put ourselves inside the debate there. But yeah, Ryle is definitely an evangelical bishop. There are, there is a, uh, a high church movement brewing. There are, there are people who want to be more Baptist than Anglican even present. So history kind of repeats itself. Right. And I, we should be clear, uh, he's not quite a bishop yet. Right. This, right. He, in Helmingham, he's still just a uh, a minister. But we'll get to that as we move forward here. But I do want to say just a little bit more about his, you know, moving forward in his life so that we can get through to the rest of it in the next segment. He is at Helmingham for a while. And while he's there, he does get remarried in 1850. And five children are born to that union. Um, but his second wife was also generally sickly and would die 10 years later in 1860. Ryle also during this time period is beginning to become nationally known in England, especially because of his tracks. Uh, He also begins a number of speaking engagements as a result of his popularity. And he's also emphasizing uh, Puritan theology in a time when they are generally ignored or generally attacked because of who they were, which I think is something telling as well. Yeah, it, it, yeah. If you if you if you think that the Puritans are demonized today, it happened in it was going on two hundred years ago too. Right. I mean, especially after the age of Puritanism came to an end, I don't. I mean, was there a time when they were ever really really popular in England? What do you think? <laughs> well, they wanted them out. Right. No, I mean, really, yeah, in circles, but never never really broadly. I would argue, unless they were in power, but right. So, so for Ryle to emphasize Puritans in that time period was notable in itself, and may have contributed a little bit to them becoming more popular in that time. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right, we got to take our next break. We'll be right back with more word fitly spoken after this. <laughs> 
back, everyone. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm Willie Grills here with Zell and Heidi. We're talking about J.C. Ryle. Now, during the break uh, between recording the, the last segment and this one, uh, Zellin could barely hold back the rare display of Norwegian rage. He felt that he didn't get to dunk on the Tractarians enough. So we're going to give him a chance to do that here. Now. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm repressing my rage again, <laughs> as as the Norwegian does. I, I I guess my my major concern with it is that it would devolve into a kind of tradition for tradition's sake. Uh, to introduce things that have never been known in a parish, that sort of thing. And I think, you know, that can be done in a way which is not as helpful, especially if we're doing it at the expense of everything else. And I, I guess that's, that's the major concern I have with uh, tractarianism uh, in general. Does that make sense, Willie? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're, you're not going to introduce the rough. Right. Because, <laughs> I mean... It would basically be LARPing. Let's let's just be honest, right? And and this is, you know, like I've said before, we don't really have a dog in this fight because it's a Church of England thing. But both sides of that, you know, the evangelical side and the Oxford movement, did a lot of good things, sure. um, relatively speaking. So at least at least things that we could laud within reason. But let's get back to to Ryle and kind of finish up with his life and then talk about why he's at least worth a read. Sure. So we left off around 1860, 1861 in in Ryle's life. And in that year, 1861, he accepts a call to Stradbroke, where he will be for the next 20 years of his life or so. Uh, It's also during this time that he marries his third wife, Henrietta, in October of that same year. And she would be the wife that would actually be married to him the longest. Of course, we should say, of course, as we mentioned earlier, this is his third wife because his previous two died, not because of divorce or anything like that. So just Mm -hmm. want to make sure that's perfectly clear. Um, But during his time at Stradbroke, Ryle wrote a lot more books, including some of his best known works. I believe Holiness was written during his time in Stradbroke. Am I correct on that, Willie? Mm -hmm. Uh, What about his... uh, explanatory notes that was kind of a long project but um the expository thoughts yeah expository thoughts i I couldn't think of the right title yeah uh, so the expository thoughts are his um little summaries of the gospels but they're they're more or less a verse by verse uh like um (laughs) expository thoughts exegetical things because i don't want to just repeat (laughs) exactly there is exegetical thoughts. No. Um, so there, it's a neat thing that he has done. It's kind of a concise summary of portions of the, of the books and he goes all the way through them. Right. So it's like a study Bible, but not a study Bible. Right. And he's, much it's, a, it, it's a, it's a mini commentary. Right. Right. And the further along he goes in the project, uh, the more in depth he gets so that Matthew and Mark, for example, you know, kind of get a few sentences here and there. But by the time he gets into Luke and especially John, John has two volumes in most printed editions. You know, he gets a lot more in depth with his thoughts and it becomes one of his best known works. And I, and I, I often find his thoughts to be, you know, thought provoking, something to at least consider. Yeah. You know, something certainly worth looking into. Um, do you want to say anything about like holiness or life um, of the path or anything of, the, of his other major works? I mean, we'll get into that once we finish up the the biographical stuff. Okay. Okay, we can do that. So anyway, so he writes a lot of books in Stradbroke, and then eventually, 20 years later, he receives a surprise call, surprising to him at least, on in February of 1880. And at that time, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, <laughs> is it echoing in here? I'm not really <laughs> sure who is a famous politician in the time period, offers him a deanery at Salisbury Cathedral. And this was very much a political move on Disraeli's part. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Ryle doesn't want to go initially, but he finally kind of begrudgingly accepts it. But before he's able to, before he actually goes to Salisbury, he's offered a new call 
which is a bishopric in Liverpool, which he accepts and becomes uh, the bishop in the same year. So now an evangelical is has become a bishop within the Church of England, admittedly for political reasons. Right. And, that, and Disraeli, the prime minister, who, you know, it's England, so it gets all, this is how it works, um, favored low churchmen in these positions for political reasons. And, right. and um, it's all tied up again. I mean, we go back to the Oxford movement. It is, it, it is kicked off for political reasons. Right. Uh, and I, I don't want to, we should just do a whole episode on the Oxford movement because I will take up way too much time with it. <laughs> but we forget just how anti-Catholic England is right. well into the 19th century. Right. It's illegal. Until um, the 19th century. So all of this is tied up in, in politics. But, hey, that's a lot of church history. Well, and especially because uh, Disraeli also wanted to kind of score a point over Gladstone, uh, who was very much more of a, you know, sympathetic to, tra- to Tractarians and to that whole movement. Right. And so by doing this, it was a very political act on Disraeli's part, but Ryle sees it as an actual call from God. Yes. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that, yeah, absolutely, 100% fair. That, that's absolutely how he sees it. Okay. Um, I mean, do you want to say anything about Disraeli? But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, his dad converts to the Church of England after a dispute with the synagogue and things like that. I don't know. It, Interesting, interesting path for me, but that's a, that's another episode, (laughs) but it does, it does put him where he is. And, you know, people are, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, there, there will be uh, the general attitude that Ryle was very fair and very pastoral, even to those on the other side of the aisle. Right. It's very easy to kind of draw the political lines within the church and even the doctrinal lines. And sometimes you have to. But to, but to forego any kind of charity is just not Christian. That there, will, there is a time where you draw the line in the sand and say, listen, we're not in fellowship anymore. I understand that. But there are certain, to a certain degree, we give charity to those on the other side of certain issues. Right. Right. Well, and I think, too, you know, we might kind of quibble with how Ryle became a bishop. But at the same time, I think Ryle rightly recognizes that God is still using that maneuvering. I mean, that's all it is. It's political maneuvering for a grander purpose, for a greater design. Because just like with Joseph, you know, God can bring good out of evil. I mean, and so I don't think we want to disparage his becoming a bishop in that way or thinking that he was somehow maneuvering himself to become bishop because he certainly wasn't. But God still uses that for great good, which, of course, we see in his time uh, in Liverpool, where he becomes very, like you say, charitable, even towards his opponents, uh, where he be, he very earnestly works among the laboring classes to bring them the gospel as well. I mean, he is a man who embodies what it means to proclaim the gospel. And I think that more than anything is probably why we have focused on him today. Right. And I don't know if you mentioned it, but he's promoted a Bishop of Liverpool, but he's also the first Bishop of Liverpool. I don't think I mentioned that. No. Yeah. So that's, that's unique. Yeah. I'd hate to see where Liverpool is these days. Right. I think it's, I think it's vacant right now, but you know how those things all shift. Right. (laughs) Well, at any rate, poor health late in his life, leads him to resign on March 1st, 1900, and he dies uh, three months later, June 10th, 1900. And that marks the end of his earthly course. So Right. He's uh, buried at All Saints in Liverpool, and that's where he rests to this day. So, so his legacy is ultimately going to be preserved in publishing. So we talked about expository thoughts. He's going to publish uh, Holiness is probably his next most notable work, Practical Religion, Simplicity, Thoughts for Young Men. You know, all of these are uh, are worth reading. And 
and and they're back in print now. Right. Well, I think even even if we as Lutherans, like we said earlier in the episode, we might quibble about some of his articles, especially when he talks about things like uh, regeneration or when he talks about the sacraments. You know, we're going to rightly quibble with those things, and we should. But at the same time, the way that he says many of these other things are, I mean, they're very notable. And I, they, they are put very well. And if nothing else... You know, they're they're worth reading for that reason. Yeah, he is going to um, exhort men to a living Christianity. He presents a masculine Christianity, mm-hmm. a Christianity that is not simply a spectator kind of thing. And understand, it's not like he's not preaching against, you know, God passively, you, you passively receiving God's gifts in the service or something like that. He is preaching against indifference. People who have not darkened church doors in years and who are resting in this kind of security. Uh, a message that, frankly, is sorely needed. And and so he, he, he lights a bit of a fire. Uh, he is very much a pastor. Uh, he writes at length about prayer and the need for prayer, scripture study. He contends for the historic doctrines of the faith. He preaches a lot about the cross, the need for the resurrection, the necessity of Christ shedding his blood. And then he writes in very practical ways, uh, things that people are, are really hungry for. And his his works do not seem dated. They're out there. They're available. They're public domain. And so you can get them relatively cheaply. Well, and I think your emphasis on his speaking against indifference is something that we really need to emphasize, you know, in, in this episode. Because, you know, he's he is talking to people who believe that because, you know, they're on the church rolls somewhere, that that passes for, you know, a a living Christianity. That as long as I'm connected to something, no matter what it is, that is good enough. And I can live my life however I want. Which, frankly, I mean, do we not see that in our own day? Right. Maybe less and less as people move away from the church, but still this kind of indifference towards the gospel. Right. You know, I think one of his works that was huge in its day, but is not one of his most notable today, is Knots Untied, which kind of begins his Practical Religion series. Uh, right. Holiness is part is the last of that four volume series. The other two being Practical Religion and Old Paths. Yeah, I mean he's he's going to write. Get this though, as if God is in heaven, you know, as if he's <laughs> as if he's real, and it needs to be. Uh, <laughs> and you need to believe on him. Uh, it, it It's very refreshing. He writes uh, beautifully about providence and God's hand in all things. I'll share uh, this quote that I, that I shared with you earlier today, I believe. Uh, your trials may be many and great. Your cross may be very heavy, but the business of your soul is all conducting according to an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. All things are working together for your good. Your sorrows are only purifying your soul for glory. Your bereavements are only fashioning you as a polished stone for the temple above, made without hands. From whatever quarter the storms blow, they only drive you nearer to heaven. Whatever weather you may go through, it is only ripening you for the garner of God. Your best things are quite safe. So, I mean, this this beautiful assurance that God's hand is in all things, and and so uh, we need uh, we need to hear that. This is exactly what we um, what we talk about on Word Fitly a lot when we talk about the, the, for example, the episode about closing churches or the episodes about not closing churches or taking the mark or whatever. You have to understand and see God's hand in all things, and trust in God's promises and trust in the new covenant in His blood. And the promise associated with that is that no one can snatch you out of his hand, that all things do work for good. All things made clear in the scriptures that these promises are for are for Christians and that God will deliver them out of all their afflictions. If we don't have a robust understanding of providence and of God being actually alive and in creation, then we will give way to despair, either despair or indifference. And neither of those is acceptable for they are both contrary to faith. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's why having these things spelled out so clearly by Ryle is so helpful. 
Uh, another quote, just to throw it out there to give an idea, is he's talking about Bible reading. Ryle says, I fear we are in danger of forgetting that to have the Bible is one thing and to read it quite another, mm -hmm. which, which I think is a beautiful quote because it emphasizes the great need for, I mean, being in the word, actually reading these things, actually studying them, you know, being, being enriched by them each and every day. You know, so, I mean, it is, it is this practical kind of language that I think is the most beneficial thing about what Ryle is doing. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what we're talking about. Um, we, we took kind of the long way around with his biography and got off on a bit of a long detour on the Tractarians. But you have to understand the time that he lives, in which right. he lives. And, you know, so th there is something to be gained by reading him. And he's also got a great beard. It's true. It really is. <laughs> One thing that I would emphasize as we're coming towards the end of this episode is another thing that we sh should imitate Ryle in is the fact that he was willing to stand alone in the face of a rapidly changing world. Yes. Because remember, towards the end of the 19th century, and especially as we're getting into the beginning of the 20th, uh, we are seeing very much the rise of modernist kind of thinking, uh, things that, you know, Wham, of course, would go on to preach against in the following century. But these were just beginning to really take root, especially in England. Even Ryle's own son, Herbert, for example, uh, unfortunately became one of the proponents of this new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And But Ryle was not willing to go along with the times on this and stood his ground in the face of virtually overwhelming opposition, sometimes even being the lone dissenting voice in some of these things. And I think that that kind of uh, courage, that kind of steadfastness is something that we would do well to imitate. Yes, absolutely. Be prepared to stand alone. Not all of you are going to find yourselves in communities where you have a strong church. And I think that that's going to be true going forward. When you are able to stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with like-minded brothers, that is better. But there will be times where you might find yourself to be the lonely man. And you must stand firm in that. Pastors, you know, there's going to be times where your whole congregation might be on the side of the devil, but you've got to stand firm there. And so, you know, look look to someone like him who, in the face of adversity, held to, you know, the resurrection of Christ, the virgin birth, the divinity of Jesus, things like that. Well, even even if it meant standing alone, even in his own family. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that, that's going to be a call. You know, Pastor Layman doesn't matter. Many will find themselves in that case. But yeah, so I think he's certainly worth reading for that reason, even if we can't agree with everything that he says. Right. So. And we've got we'll have some more biographical ones, some maybe even some uh, third rails. We'll see. We'll see what kind of we'll see how the fire falls on those. So anyway, this has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard and want to know more, check us out, wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter, at wordfitly. I'm Willie Grills here with Zell and Heidi. God love you, and God bless. He does not regard the quantity of faith, but the quality. He does not measure its degree, but its truth. He will not break any bruised reed, nor quench any smoking flax. He will never let it be said that any perished at the foot of the cross. J.C. Ryle